known as the Platypus Affiliated Society. Um, the Platypus Affiliated Society is a group of largely Chicago-based activists, activists, students, and teachers established in December of 2006 for the purposes of or organizing reading group, public fora, research, and journalism that focuses on the problems and tasks inherited from the old 1920s-30s left, the new 1960s-70s left, and the post-political 1980s-1990s left. <clears throat> largely for the purposes of establishing the potentials of emancipatory politics today. Um, the group largely focuses on self-education self and self-criticism, and it examines the history of the Marxist revolutionary left for the purposes of fostering what we refer to as critical historical consciousness. And by critical, I don't simply mean that we examine the history of the actual successes and failures of the Marxist left in order to reject, condemn, or determine how we might be better, but to actually determine how on a deeper, truer level of what the term critique means, what a deeper level of understanding of the theoretical and practical purposes of that Marxist left was, how its failures have constituted the world as we know it today. And so in other words, that presents the present in a very di different picture, not as simply the unfolding of objectivistic process of state and economy or successful offenses of the right from the 1930s on, but rather constituted by the actual failures of the actually existing historical left, above all, the revolutionary Marxist left. <clears throat> now, I just want to talk briefly, if I could, about some of the events and fora and reading groups we'll be sponsoring, both we sponsor both now and we'll be sponsoring in the future. Um, and additionally, by the way, the Platypus Affiliated Society is available outside. The Statement of Purpose and a Brief History is available if any of you want to inquire more into it. Um, at present, we have plans to begin two reading groups, uh, one of which will be hosted at the University of Chicago and will meet in the basement of the Reynolds Club on alternate Sundays beginning February 10th from 1 to 4 p.m. Uh, the other reading group will meet at the same time, again, alternate Sundays uh, beginning February 10th from 1 to 4 p.m. at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in room 920 of their building at 112 South Michigan. Um, the reading list for both of these groups is also available in the front, if anyone would like to read it. The first several weeks of the readings are available there. And they're open to all comers, uh, people who might identify themselves as left, non-sectarian, uh, irrespective of whether or not it comes from a Marxist or a non-Marxist orientation. I also want to say that we will be hosting additional forums like this in the near and far future. First, on the 8th of March, we'll host a forum on Israel-Palestine. And then that will be followed by a forum we're calling 40 Years of May 68, which will obviously be a commemoration and um, critical inquiry into the events of May 68, which will happen appropriately enough in May of 2008. Um, also, finally, I'd like to mention the newspaper, which Manan was uh, nice enough to advertise for us. Um, it's the second issue that's been published. Um, it's, I think, you know, uh, e I, I, of course, love the first issue, and this issue is, I think, even much better than the first. And there's going to be a celebratory party for the publication of this. And that's going to be, um, sorry, let me get the actual date here. That is going to be the benefit party will be at the hideout at 1354 West Wabansia on February 16th. That's a Saturday from 4 to 7 p.m. So again, reading groups coming up, starting at the University of Chicago, the School of the Art Institute on February 10th, meeting alternate Sundays. The newspaper has been published. There'll be a party for that on February 16th. And beyond that, there's, of course, also the website, www.platypus1917.com and www.platypus1917.org, which will be able to give you much more detailed and thorough information about the group's present and future activities. And you'll be able to contact people who um, are long-term of the group that can inform you much better than I can of the goings-on um, of Platypus. Okay, after that brief introduction of the group, I just now want to turn to um, the topic of this afternoon, the failure of Pakistan, and simply describe what the format will be. All three of our speakers will speak for about 10 minutes. They'll give introductory remarks. Following those introductory remarks, we have 30 minutes of discussion amongst themselves, really, in which we hope that they'll put questions to one another, talk about the issues at hand, and, and perhaps even debate if they have disagreements on their perspectives with regard to contemporary Pakistan. And that then will be followed by a question and answer period. And we have a very strong commitment that everyone who has one or two questions will get their questions placed. So that may go on for some time afterwards. 
Um, now let me just introduce the speakers in the order of how they'll present their introductory remarks. Um, first speaker on the far left here of, oh, sorry, this is um, my far right, but your far left, Manan Ahmed. Uh, Manan is currently, um, is a historian of Islam in South Asia. He is currently preparing to defend his dissertation entitled Memory After History, The Conquest of Al Sind in the South Asian Languages and Civilization Department at the University of Chicago. Manan writes and blogs at Chapati Mystery, and in addition, he's presented on the questions we'll be discussing today at fora such as Democracy Now! and Chicago Public Radio. Um, our second speaker is uh, Aisha Siddiqua. Um, she served as a civil servant in Pakistan from 1988 until 2001 and is now a military analyst and public intellectual. She has a doctorate in war studies from King's College and is a Ford Fellow and was the Pakistan Scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Studies from 2004 to 2005. <clears throat> she is widely recognized as a leading authority on Pakistan's military. In addition to the numerous articles and papers, in addition to her numerous articles and papers, Dr. Siddiqua published, published books include the 2001 title, Pakistan's, uh, <clears throat> Pakistan's Arms Procure Procurement and Military Buildup in Search of a Policy, uh, as well as the recent April 2007 title, Military Incorporated, Inside Pakistan's Military Economy. Um, it's actually a really great privilege of, of the Platypus Affiliate Society to be able to have her to speak with us today. And so I'll shut up now and now move on to uh, the first introductory remarks from uh, Manan Ahmed. Oh, sorry. Oh, I have forgotten to introduce, I'm an idiot. I have gotten, forgotten to introduce our own member. Um, uh, <laughs> On the presumption, of course, that she needs no introduction. Um, uh, Atiyah Khan is a doctoral candidate in the Department of History at the <laughs> University of Chicago who works on the vicissitude of leftist politics in Pakistan from 1947 to 1971. And her and her colleague slash husband, Sunit Singh, have a very interesting, both brilliant and provocative article on the contemporary situation of Pakistan and the historical structures that inform it in none other than the second and most recent issue of the Platypus Review. So, Atiyah, my apologies for skipping over in the introduction. Now I'll allow Manan to go ahead and make his introductory remarks. Thank you. Um, thank you and welcome, everybody, for coming out on a Saturday afternoon. And I'm sure there are much funner things to do than discuss the failure of Pakistan. Um, I am perhaps the least qualified member of this illustrious panel. I'm a medievalist. I work on Pakistan in the 8th century, which um, doesn't really inform much. But I'm also a consumer of news, just like you are. I read um, things about Pakistan, and I'm interested in why we talk about Pakistan and not talk about, for example, Burma or Zimbabwe or other states that are called failed. Um, and so that's what I want to begin my remarks with, and I want to concentrate a little bit on that because I know that um, in our Q&A and in, in, the, in the comments of my co-panelists, we'll get a lot more into the details of what's going on inside Pakistan. Um, so why do we talk about Pakistan? Um, the obvious answer that um, sort of solicits itself is, of course, the global war on terrorism. Uh, or terror, I'm sorry. Global war on terror and uh, Pakistan's role and Pakistan's position in that. In yesterday's New York Times, there was an op-ed piece by a one Selig Harrison called Drawn and Quartered. I don't know if anybody saw it. Um, it was a very interesting, horribly misinformed, historically, that is, piece that still, um, I thought, illustrated why Pakistan is a subject of discussion at all and what types of... Um, analytic landscape it is that presents itself when we talk about Pakistan. The op-ed that, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, you guys can go online and sort of read it. I don't want to take the time and deconstruct it here. I just want to start with the sentence that he ends with, which is, um, all concern, I quote here, all concern, including the United States, have a profound stake in stopping the present slide to balkanization. The profound stake, that's what I'm kind of interested about. What is this profound stake that we have as a country, as a nation in Pakistan? And what are the historical and theoretical underpinnings to this profound stake? Um, the profound stakes into Pakistan emerged very soon after Pakistan's independence from 
British colonial uh, rule in 1947 and the establishment of India and Pakistan, which are kind of hazily up there on that map. Um, so just to give a very, very one-sentence history, the, the, the British um, had an empire in South Southeast Asia for about two, 250 years, and maybe James is a better authority than me on that. Um, and that it, the empire ended in the post-World War II phase, um, along with other places around the country, and the um, beginnings of na na national, na nation states, um, the creation of nation states, and Pakistan being one of them. In, in the initial thrust, the United States wasn't terribly impressed or interested in Pakistan, and that would be the first couple of years, so 47, 48, 49. In fact, the founding father, as they're called, uh, of Pakistan, a uh, gentleman by the name of Muhammad Ali Jinnah, tried to solicit um, aid, military and otherwise, uh, for Pakistan, and the Truman administration wasn't entirely um, that interested. However, that soon changed as the post-Cold War uh, period set itself up, and the Soviet designs on the region, which is thankfully, thank you, um, bordering Afghanistan um, on the map above, uh, began to take shape. And Pakistan emerged as a potential partner in a global detente between the United States and the USSR. India, uh, after its uh, arrival on the world stage, uh, under Nehru's guidance, was much more, um, let's see, much more cold. <laughs> Towards, uh, towards the United States, if not um, overtly hostile in certain cases. It was under Eisenhower and in, in Pakistan in the, during the late 50s to early 60s, Ayub Khan was a dictator in charge, um, that Pakistan-United States relationship really began to um, sort of flower, as it were. Um, the man that is often credited for at least bringing um, the initial um, uh, warmth into that relationship is one, uh, the foreign minister of Pakistan from 1962, Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, who went on to become the prime minister of Pakistan and is the father of the recently assassinated Benazir uh, Bhutto. And I'm going to talk about why the Bhuttos um, were popular as they were in, in, in the United States. So anyways, after Eisenhower, who, who toured Pakistan, um, you had the Nixon administration and their quote-unquote Pakistan tilt, which was again a balancing act uh, that gave a lot of aid to Pakistan, both military training and uh, Professor Siddiqui obviously is the authority on that historical development. Um, but along with that, there was also a seat for Pakistan as a potential um, military allies. So um, often the United States uh, intelligence and military community would, would uh, game scenarios within which Pakistan's uh, planes, that would be so Lahore and Multan plane, as in not those planes, but playing level fields, could be used as launching um, launch pads for attacks into USSR. So it was very strategic that United States uh, focused itself on, on developing Pakistan as a key ally in their war against communism. That war, of course, heated up once uh, Afghanistan, two events happened in 1979 that really transformed Pakistan into a semi-ally to a crucial frontline or frontier state. The two events were the Islamic Revolution in Iran and the, um, the, outs, uh, the ousting of the Shah of Iran and the uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And both of these events in 1979 crystallized the, for the United States the need for active, that is to say hot, uh, friendship, allies, bases in, in that region. The fear on the, on the Iran front was of course that the Islamic Revolution was going to quote unquote spill over. Uh, Pakistan being the next target and Afghanistan and so on and so forth until you have a green planet uh, and not in the <laughs> sense we talk about green planets now. 
Um, the other fear um, of the communism was exactly the same, except in reverse in this sense. So the Soviets were going to take over Afghanistan and then march through um, Pakistan and, I don't know, come to D.C. Um, so this was when, uh, under uh, President Reagan, that we decided to funnel military aid directly for a hot war against the Soviet being fought by our proxy, Pakistan. Uh, its uh, establishment, military establishment, but also its political establishment had a significant role to play, which is something that is not often analyzed by uh, historians and political scientists um, who focus on the military, but I think the, the political and ideological role that was played by Zia al Haq, then dictator of Pakistan, in the struggle against uh, communism. Um, the last part of our escalation in our friendship, quote-unquote, with Pakistan, of course, occurred in October of 2001, when uh, Dick Armitage famously uh, persuaded Pakistan to uh, play by the rules as they are being put out. Um, and again, Pakistan sided up with the United States and was, if is, it remains a frontline state in trying to um, you know, fight this war. And the effect of it is, uh, if you read that drawn and quartered article or op-ed from yesterday, is in fact the very fear of dissolution of the state of Pakistan. So, so that's very roughly um, a, a brief overview of United States uh, involvement with, with Pakistan. But my talk was titled Bhutto's Populism. And I want to Again, very briefly talk about why is it that the United States has had a very um, people-fronted or person-fronted relationship with Pakistan. Uh, and I don't mean necessarily the dictators that we have supported from Ayub, so that is from the 50s to Musharraf in the 2000s. Um, but I also mean that our policy has privileged some um, particular segments and some particular elites as representatives of Pakistan in whichever form we want to understand that, that is cultural or political or elsewhere. Um, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, uh, and we can return to this later on, and Benazir uh, Bhutto both have uh, enjoyed widespread uh, favor in Washington and in London. Um, they were considered to be much more trustworthy um, they had particular uh, characteristics that distinguished themselves as interlocutors, as intermediaries, and as leaders of the state of Pakistan. Um, part of it that, you know, in the aftermath of Benazir Bhutto's uh, assassination, um, if you read the numerous, numerous, numerous op-eds and articles that commemorated her life, written almost entirely by Washington press and political elite, they all had very personal reflections on her, uh, how they knew her, how they dined with her, how they uh, hung out at her house in Larkana or in um, Surrey or in Dubai or in D.C. itself, and how she sort of embodied hope and she embodied the people of Pakistan and their uh, tribulations and their trials. And the similar stories, of course, were evident when Zulfagarli Bhutto was hung by General Zia al-Haq in 1979. Um, there are four things that um, are apparent in immediately when one looks at the, this uh, post-Morton uh, analysis. One is their education. It's always highlighted that while well, they were educated in U U.S. and U.K. at our high, highest le uh, levels of our, um, our you know, education available at Ivy Leagues such as Oxford and Harvard. Um, that they had an affinity for Western moors and Western attires, that they were sympathetic to United States and United Kingdom elites, so not necessarily to the political agenda, but to the people in power um, as they, they are themselves constructed. And lastly, that they had a very real sense of pre-martyrdom. They often talked about their own demise, their own doomed futures, and these are literary tropes in a real sense that emerge in many of the conversations that um, happen in aftermath of both of their, their deaths. They're, these tropes tell us nothing about 
Zulfikar Ali Bhutto or his policies or Benazir Bhutto or her history in the people of Pakistan. But it tells us as historians as, as, and as uh, consumers of news everything that we need to know about ourselves. Who is it that we consider to be our interlocutors? How do we imagine that other um, far away in some other land that we do not have any access to supposedly and we don't have any history of? Pakistan is born anew every time a crisis happens. Um, it suddenly emerges and experts sort of spring up like myself and try to explain to you all what it is this distant nation is. But in fact, Pakistan has a history that is intimately tied to our history and has never been divorced for good or ill. And it's our amnesia, our collective amnesia, that allows us to construct um, seriously detached figures for our analysis, people like Benazir Bhutto and Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. I'm going to stop there, and hopefully we'll return to one or many of these questions uh, later on. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome, folks. Uh, you see, when I looked at the title of the seminar today, what struck me was the term failure. Um, have we decided already that Pakistan is a failed state? Uh, and before that, what is, how do you define a failed state? I mean, uh, in, in, in academia, in social science research, there is actually no consensus on how do you define a failed state. Uh, I mean, on the face of it, things function in Pakistan. Uh, it has a military, it has a bureaucracy, which probably functions as good or as bad as uh, you know, the bureaucracy in Pakistan, uh, in the United States. Uh, so what is it? Is it something to do with the imagination or expectation of the man on the street? Uh, when the state fails to deliver to the people, when it fails to capture their imagination, perhaps that's once the state uh, you know, uh, could be termed as a failed state. But how does one reach that point when it fails to catch the imagination of, of, of its people? And one of the methods to do that, one of the recipes is the institutional, the, the, the great institutional uh, imbalances. My colleague here, Manan, was talking about the interest and the linkages between uh, Pakistan and the United States, the historical linkages. And he was talking about how the uh, United States has been supporting not just military dictators, but also, uh, you know, also politicians. And, and he referred to two politicians here, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto and, and uh, Benazir Bhutto, who were seen as symbols of modernity. In fact, the United States has a critical role to play uh, in the manner in which institutional imbalances have developed in Pakistan. Uh, and you know, this photograph perhaps captures it. Uh, contrary to your belief that marriages are made in heaven, some of the marriages are made in Washington, <laughs> D.C. as well. Uh, this is very obvious. <clears throat> Why was Benazir Bhutto being encouraged to return to Pakistan? Uh, again, search for modernity. The linkage, I mean, Benazir was seen by Washington as a symbol of modernity, secularism, who would then go and, uh, you know, cooperate with another symbol of modernity, uh, which is General Musharraf. Over the 60 years, uh, or 55 or 60 years of Pakistan-U.S. relations, there has been this peculiar search for modernity, of, of uh, you know, nurturing uh, modernity in that, in that country, which has, in, in many ways, fortunately, in many ways, unfortunately, has led to strengthening of the military institution. Uh, it is a very strong institution. Uh, 
throughout the 1950s, 1960s, and then the 1980s, and, and, and now after 2001. There has been, always been, whenever there has been this cooperation between uh, United States and Pakistan, the bulk of the aid which has been provided uh, is military aid. Uh, in 1980s, it was half and half. Now, in, in 2001, it's uh, reportedly it's again half and half. But there are a lot of, uh, of funds which, which uh, never make it, uh, you know, uh, before, before the public. Uh, for example, the government says there are $9.8 billion which have been transferred to Pakistan as military aid. But another five billion dollars are in, in uh, are in the form of covert aid uh, to intelligence agencies. Why is that? Now that is partly to do with Americans' conceptualization, or American states' conceptualization of modernity in the framework of the Cold War. Uh, a lot of American academics, Morris Jenowitz being one, used to talk about third world developing countries' militaries as these hub or centers of development, of modernity. You know, they were exposed to technology. They could fly fighter aircrafts. They could uh, drive tanks. They were exposed to modern technology. And there was this hope that there would be uh, naturally be a spin-off. Uh, of this of this modernity, very specific modernity towards the society, but what it has done instead was strengthened uh, the institution. The spin-off was not towards. There was actually no spin-off, not you know, not a huge spin-off, but there was more a spin-in towards strengthening the military institution and strengthening its uh, its control of the society, the polity, and the economy. In, in my next two to three minutes, I'm going to talk about very quickly how the military in Pakistan has institutionalized its political control by dominating other sectors as well. I mean, it is today a very powerful force in the society, not just because it has a political role. The first time the military came into power directly was in 1958. Remained there till 1971. Uh, there was this interlude of civilian government, Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, 70 to 77. Then the military came in for another 10 years. Didn't leave until 1988. Then another interlude of 10 years, and now we have the military back in the form of General Musharraf, 99 uh, till present. Uh, the reason I'm not saying that, you know, it has gone back to the barracks because General Musharraf became the president as while he was the army chief. So the linkages are very much there. Uh, it might not be now in the in the in the in the front seat, but the military is definitely in the back seat. In the 1990s, the period when Nawaz Sharif and Benazir Bhutto, when we had political governments, military was effectively in the back seat uh, uh, controlling. But let me quickly share with you some of the results of my work, which I did on the military economy. Uh, this is, this is uh, I consider, one of the important segments of, of militaries, of explaining militaries' institutional power. Uh, this is not about just capital formation. It's about enhancing the power of, of the armed forces. Uh, the financial autonomy which the military generates by, being, by its presence in the economy feeds directly into its political influence. Uh, military operates at three levels, at the institutional level, at the level of the subsidiaries, and at, you know, in, in the form of individuals. It's in the informal economy, it's in, uh, present in the informal economy, and it's present in the uh, illegal economy. Uh, the three segments of the economy, which is agriculture, service industry, uh, in, uh, and, and a manufacturing industry, it, it, uh, it is one of the dominant players. Uh, it's almost like what we used to have in Latin America. The f this is quickly going through, uh, you know, the, the first level, which is the cooperatives and, and or small and medium enterprises. The 136 million is what they 
gifts they claim that they earn from it but the value it does not say anything about the value of the assets and these are some of the operations i mean these are hundreds of operations which are not quantified because they're not transparent at all uh the military uses uh state land uh and here you see an advertisement uh in one of the newspapers in which one of the cantonment has chosen to commercialize uh you know the institution uses its authority and decides on itself that how it's going to use state land uh then you have public sector organizations uh uh you know in fact there are three public sector organizations which which are into which are playing a commercial role and let me quickly give you an example uh one of the organizations here front fwo fwo stands for frontier works organization which is one of the largest uh uh public sector uh contractors they were recently given a contract to construct a 10.1 kilometer road inside uh Ravalpindi which is uh, which is adjacent is a small city uh, well it's a cantonment city adjacent to uh, Islamabad the capital the 10.1 km road would be constructed in 18.8 billion rupees which means 1.8 billion rupees per uh, km what under nawaz sharif that was the prime minister one of the prime minister in the 1990s we built the famous uh, road from lahore to islamabad uh, which is about almost 400 kilometers in which we spent much less money this contract on the other hand was given without open bidding so that's how they uh, manipulate then you have the subsidiaries we have the first one forgy foundation forgy means soldier by the way uh you know they're into fertilizer manufacturing cement uh, they're into it they're into education oil and gas all major sectors then you have 41 projects being run by army welfare trust and when i say projects uh, let me uh, explain these are companies uh they are into finance banking it private security uh you can see the extent of their then this is a foundation run by the air force which has an airline uh cargo uh and this the last one is by uh the navy uh and you know they uh you know they're into uh, several activities as well but more than that what makes its institutional power much more obvious and in people's face is that the military has also become the new land barons uh it controls 11.58 billion um, million acres uh which is about 12% of the state land and uh this these are some of the views uh of of uh, the lands they have this is the agricultural land which is given to military officers uh they also get land in in the urban centers but more than that uh they get they have in the in the past 8 years that musharraf was there and this is repeated i mean it happened in early, under the uh, un, under earlier dictators as well it has in fact intensified under musharraf is that the way they have penetrated the public sector i mean we talk about institutional growth i mean how could you have institutional growth when everywhere you know in in all key departments civilians are then replaced by serving or retired military officers the assumption is they these guys do a better job they are modern right the symbols of modernity so they can do a job better uh, than the civilians but how would you then uh build the capacity of the civilians who ultimately have to run the show <coughs> so what this does is on the one hand it gives these institution and this institutional strength uh makes a pakistan creates a pakistan which looks very modern i mean look at these roads uh you know wonderful highways but what it does hide is that this institutional power uh predates on uh on the subaltern the people of pakistan the ordinary people of pakistan who are not beneficiaries of 
of this modernity and of this development. And mind you, it's not just the people of Pakistan who are not part of this modernity. There is a subaltern within the military as well. The beneficiaries of this institutional growth are primarily the officer cadre and, this, this, and especially the senior, the, the, uh, the military elite. There is elite. For example, let me quickly give you one uh, example, education. The army has a beautiful system of education uh, for its officers and, and if it's uh, for its officials. Technically, there is no uh, differentiation between the soldier's son and daughter and the officer's son and daughter. But actually, in reality, the officer's children go to one kind of school and the soldiers go to another kind of school. And the, the amount of resources which are put into one system versus the other is totally different. Uh, so what you then have is, one, the complete neglect of the subaltern, but then also strengthening of the institution to dominate the state and dominate the current discourse. I mean, these are some of the pictures of what has been happening. This is, this is a picture from what the state did recently. I mean, this is, this is a son of one of the people who were picked up by the intelligence agencies. And many came out to protest. This is uh, what, has, uh, what happens. Uh, so the question is, how do you, you know, how do you, you know, save the country? How do you uh, stop it? And the answer is, we have to return to correcting uh, the, the institutional imbalance. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I will pick up. Uh, from the opening remarks of Professor Siddiqua when she was actually questioning what marks the failure of a state. In my presentation, I'm going to address the failure of Pakistan and argue that the fact that there is no independent functioning judiciary in the country, that there is a violent rise of Islamic fundamentalism in the Northwest and as well as in the cities, that there is an enormous expansion of military power, especially in commerce, as has been shown by Professor Siddiqua's recent work. And the ever-growing socioeconomic disparities in the country all point to the failure of Pakistan. I would like to argue that it is rather anachronistic to think that politically the choice was always between secular despotism and Islamic fascism in Pakistan. What this view effaces is that once there was a vital left in Pakistan. This left came to the fore, especially in 1968, when it succeeded in toppling a military regime of General Ayub Khan. So what is this left, and what is this tradition that Pakistan inherited called the left? In order to understand this question, we'll take a step back and see what were the developments, what were the phases of the uh, leftist developments in Pakistan. In pre-partition India, the question of Pakistan was, um, or was beginning to be considered seriously within the Communist Party of India after the Second World War. And that was um, under the influence of Stalinist policy on the national question, and whereby the Muslim bourgeoisie that was embodied in the Muslim League began to be perceived as a force fighting for national self-determination against colonial, colonialism. So it is since then that we begin to see that already um, the leftist politics actually has been communalized. And that's going to actually affect uh, leftist developments in Pakistan in the long run. So Stalinism is one influence that we will be talking about today and how it affected Pakistan. Yet it is important to consider that it is this tradition of the left that Pakistan inherited and played an important role instead of a democratic mass organization in the style of the Indian National Congress that was 
active in the subcontinent. So Communist Party of Pakistan, so the first phase of the left was the constitution of the Communist Party in Pakistan, both in the western half and the eastern half. So Pakistan is also a unique example of a nation state that was based on non-contiguous geographic regions. One was West Pakistan and the other was a thousand miles away uh, in the east called East Pakistan, also known as East Bengal. Communist Party in the Western half actually focused itself on the organization of trade union politics and workers' movements and was uh, organized under the organization of All Pakistan Labor Federation. Whereas in East Pakistan, it was a peasant question that was a boiling question. And especially after the success of the Chinese Revolution in 1949, it was um, the militant peasant organization that was backed by the Communist Party, which actually succeeded in exacting some uh, modest land reforms in the country in 1950. So this is the, this is the kind of a contrast or uh, difference that's going to play itself out in leftist politics in Pakistan uh, over the course of the 50s and the 60s. But in the 50s and in the early 50s, um, the left, uh, is attempting to organize itself and also is influenced or attacked by uh, certain international currents that were in operation. And one of, the, um, one of the things that happened was that in the Western half, the trade union organization was undercut by All Pakistan Labor Confederation that was actually, uh, that lined up with the American Federation of Labor, which was supposedly anti-communist. And that's going to uh, suppress the energies of the left in, in the West. And also, in 1951, uh, Communist Party of Pakistan made this uh, attempt or colluded with the army generals to organize a coup. And uh, it was a failed attempt known as the Rawalpindi conspiracy case. And since then, what began to, ha what was obvious, rather obvious, that there is a strong presence of the left that the Pakistani government had to contend with. And in order to offset that, it is in 1958 that General Ayub Khan was asked to form a government. And before that, uh, there is a lot of turmoil, political turmoil. There's a question of a problem of political representation that is brewing in the East because there is a great socioeconomic inequality that is present between the two wings and West Pakistani authorities were actually quite infamous for exploiting uh, revenues that were being accrued from East Pakistan, export surplus that was uh, gained from East Pakistan. So there's already a kind of a political tension that is brewing in the Eastern half. So 1958, we have the um, government of Ayub Khan that was actually set up to check the development of leftist organizations. And uh, already there is a kind of a systematic clampdown in process. Yet the left reconstitutes itself yet again in 1957 under an umbrella organization called the National Awami Party. Now National Awami Party also has an interesting history because it was, it also suffered as a result of the um, fractions that were created in the international left. So in 1964, there is a Sino-Soviet split. So now we have a China camp and a Moscow camp. The Eastern half or the Eastern NAP is greatly influenced by pro-China. And China started to make overtures to General Ayub Khan in a bid to form a distinct bloc against Moscow. Whereas pro-Moscow NAP is uh, quite strong in Western Pakistan, especially in Balochistan and in Sin, where they, that group is actually mired in this debate over the question of revolution in Pakistan. And there they are rather confused and short-sighted by 
uh, having a stages theory of revolution in Pakistan. And it was conceded by the party members, party leadership, that Pakistan was actually not ripe for a socialist revolution. So with that, with that development, meaning that in China, which takes a completely non-revolutionary stance, and in NAP, which actually just takes a very reformative kind of a position, there is a disillusionment that sets in among the leftist cadres. So the leftist cadres began to be incorporated, actually, by the emerging nationalist parties, one in East Pakistan, which is called the national, which is called the Awami Party or the People's Party, and a version of that was um, Bhutto's People's Party in West Pakistan that was formed in 1967. So both these nationalist parties actually benefit greatly by the incorporation of these leftist cadres that not only bring um, organization and also an attractive ideological program with them, which actually galvanized. Uh, masses for the first time in the history of Pakistan in 1968 and 69. So this eruption then in 1968 has to be understood in this background. And so the one, so their success was the elimination of Ayub Khan and there is a brief interim period that was followed by um, military dictatorship of Yahya Khan. And Yahya Khan actually was forced to hold parliamentary elections for the first time in the history of Pakistan. These elections result in a victory of East Pakistani Awami League, which became an anathema to Western uh, Pakistani government, as well as to India and to the United States, because in some sense, it was a mark of a success of the left in South Asia, in Pakistan. And that attempt or that victory is going to be thwarted by the Bangladesh war in 1971 when uh, Bhutto and the army in the West concede to go in and split the country. And that was the first major blow to the development of leftist politics in Pakistan when actually a real possibility of instituting democracy was created and was not realized at the same time. So then what happened after 1971? In 1971, as it has been claimed by quite a few leftist historians on Pakistan, that Bhutto actually had assumed power at a very extraordinary juncture when he not, not only had the support of the people, but also state apparatus available to himself to institute real changes, curb the power of the military and set Pakistan on the course of democratic development, or secular democracy. Now Bhutto failed. He not only failed or betrayed the left because quite, despite the suppression that, that ensued after 71, there was a very vibrant labor movement, especially in the city of Karachi, that was pushing its uh, party members you know, who were actually part of the government to institute reforms, to allow freedom for trade union organizations. They were also asking for better standards of living. And there, the left actually uh, proved to be rather short-sighted and believed that this, had, this process had to be carried on by step-by-step -step reforms. And that's where I think it made its mistakes. And as far as Bhutto goes, he rather turned his back on to these movements, when, especially when in Karachi, at one point, there were about 200,000 workers on the streets, and they were striking. They had brought the city to a still. Production had come to a halt. And that's when the leftist, car leftist officials actually began to plead the labor organizations to resume order and uh, back off. And this is also the moment when, again, uh, the repression of the uh, worker, working class politics continues as a result that by 1977, there is a mass exodus of working class, professional class, also intellectuals from Pakistan. So much so that a real political void was created in Pakistan. And that allowed the military to fill the gap 
and assume control of the state. And I think it's quite remarkable that it is in 19, 1979 when General Ziaul Haq executes uh, a popularly elected Prime Minister uh, Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto. So this actually marks a very con a definite shift that occurred in the in the late 70s and in the 80s, as also Professor Sadiqa points out in her work. And I think this shift is marked by the absence of the left, the decimation of the left, and was not. Um, and which is to say that the military power in Pakistan was not a given or uncontested factor. The fact that the military regime was overthrown by the people, by mass politics, tells us that there is something to be said about a political crisis in a country or the saliency of a social movement. So in today's Pakistan, the problem is that there is no social movement. And therefore, what Pakistan is left with is a form of crony capitalism, which is unchallenged. And it, I mean, it will remain so, I think, like this, in the absence of a international concerted efforts to question capital and its formation. Thank you. Um, now we're going to shift into a period of about 20 to 30 minutes of discussion between the presenters themselves. And I thought maybe I would just begin by trying to pose a question that could commence discussion and then you could take it from wherever you wanted to from there. Um, one of the things that sort of intrigued me about the per all three presentations was that in some sense the emphasis at some points on the international scene the U.S. imperialist subvention of the military dictatorship, which has allowed and fostered the rise of what Dr. Sadiqa calls Milbiz. And um, on the other hand, uh, the perspective internally within the country itself, that is the failures of certain left-wing and populist movements to really establish a challenge from civil society to reform the state and its institutions. And I'm wondering to what degree those have interacted, what their level of importance is, and where the real turning points in those sort of developments are, whether it be at the 1970s or, as Dr. Sadiqa, you talked about the Cold War social science paradigm. And I'm wondering if there was any change in that once the Soviet Union sort of fell off the map. And um, so really the larger question here is, in what sense does one understand the current situation, uh, either in terms of Washington, D.C., U.S. imperialism, inadequacies in Pakistani civil society, or some combination of these factors? Well, I, uh, I, have, I have a question for, uh, for Atiya here. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take it on from, um, you know, it's, it's part of the question that you have asked. Atiyah, you made a very interesting statement that in the 70s, military fills in a gap. And that later on, if you look at Pakistan's history, uh, it's not that military's power has never been contested. It's the other factors which kind of, <clears throat> which lead to the failure of, of an alternative political option of, of the left. Let me take you back uh, to 1947-48. In my view, it would be interesting to look at, you know, the history in terms of a building block, of the strength of an, of, uh, an institution. One in, it could be one institution or multiple institutions, but that's the way I would want to look at it. For example, 1947-48, when we do not actually begin uh, you know, to formally start discussing the left in Pakistan. 48, 40, uh, 47, 48, when the country is created, I mean, the country was born in, on 14th August 1947, and within a few months, it went into war with India. That was the first time when a war was fought. But 47, 48 is instrumental in changing the character of the state. I mean, it became a security state, and afterwards, there was no way of putting the genie back into the bottle. Uh, because after 47, 48, what happened was that predominantly, 
75% of the budget uh, started going to, to, a, to, to defense. So, you know, which, which leaves out hardly anything for, for, uh, for, for anything else in the country. And then if you go on, and this is a Gini which had been taken out by the, by the earlier politicians, including Muhammad Ali Jinnah. And I, I don't think that anybody was since then able to uh, kind of put it back into the bottle. Now, what the, if you look at the reaction of the civil society, uh, it has to a certain point contested, right? Uh, when it did not really understand what was the dimension of, that, of, the power, uh, of the institutional power of the military. They came out on the streets in, in the 1960s. We had a movement, but then you also had a war. And, you know, the military institution kind of uh, reduces in strength. 1971 war, then 90,000 prisoners of war. Pakistani army surrenders to India, then 90,000 prisoners of war. Uh, but by the time you have, and, you know, you, you again see political agitation in the 1980s. I mean, some of the pictures of what happened during Zia days tell a very interesting sort of story of the Pakistan society. People were beaten up, people were put into jail, people were tortured. I mean, the human rights atrocities that you can imagine the worst kind uh, would happen. But then what happened now? Why the sudden quiet? Why aren't people, why isn't there that mass movement? Now, one way is that yes, progressive politics failed, and you've tried to explain that. But the other way of looking at it is that as the institution's strength grew, there was also an inertia and frustration which kind of came in. Uh, and what the people saw was that, okay, uh, we have these political leaders who are also authoritarian in character, who are probably part of the same elite, uh, who probably subscribe to the same authoritarian principles as the military institutions. So what do we fight for? Uh, I mean, this is just how I imagine that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think uh, maybe where we slightly disagree is that um, I don't think that the military was such a powerful institution in the way that it is now in the 50s. Yes, in 47, 48, there was a war. I think the 50s were rather a, I mean, they were very unstable politically. And I think the, it is the institution of bureaucracy that is at the fore, rather than the organization of the military. And the military begins to uh, sort of gain strength gradually uh, as it signs mutual defense pacts with uh, the United States when it actually starts receiving military assistance. And so one, one can see the beginning of sort of the constitution of a military complex, but it is still very different. I mean, as you yourself show, uh, what it became sort of in the 1970s, late 1970s, when it assumed or when it was involved in the proxy war with Afghanistan, when it actually becomes, uh, there is a different kind of a constitution of military capital that takes hold. And that process was deeply interrupted in uh, the 70s, sort of in, the, in 1968 to 72, 73, that it was basically challenged by the political upsurge. And I think that's the moment where certain possibilities, or real hist like historical possibilities, were present to institute secular democracy in Pakistan. And it is with the decimation and systematic decimation of the left, the migration of the professional classes, middle classes, that Pakistan actually suffered then from having a real social movement. And the question that why, why don't people rise now and why is there such a, such a lull or um, certain uh, kind of passivity among the people, 
I mean, that, that's an interesting question, that why Pakistani society has accepted successive military rules in the country. And if we really push the discourse, maybe then one has to really, one probably could analyze this question in the register of psychoanalysis where there is somehow a free, fear from freedom or there is some kind of a satisfaction that people do derive from Stockholm syndrome, authority, authoritarian rulers. Can I come in for just 30 seconds? I would like to compare two situations. 1947-48, a war is being planned. Uh, there is some evidence available that Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who was the first governor general of Pakistan and the founding father as well, he knew uh, some details of what was going to happen. I mean, because that was a military which infrastructurally was not so strong. Yet it was planning a major offensive. The plan was that we'll take in the forces, use, par uh, use uh, tribals from, from up north, uh, and, in, and invade the Kashmir, uh, Jammu and Kashmir, uh, take over that, annex that territory. It's a major operation. 40 years down the line, maybe 50, another similar operation is being planned. And I'm referring here to Kargil. The claims are, yes, the prime minister knew about it. I see some commonality there. 1947-48, the, the governor general, the, you know, the civilian governor general knows. Uh, 99, the prime minister knows. Now, what these two characters are really told is, a, you know, is, 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 is the blanket proposal. The details are completely done by the military. So irrespective of how you look at the in infrastructural development of the military, from a planning perspective, there w I do not see any difference between the military of 1947-1948 and of 1999. They were doing the same thing. I think actually, not being an expert on military or the left, um, I think there is, there's some, I think both of them are right. And, and let me offer that as a, as a question to actually both of my co-panelists. Whether or not in 47, the military had the capacity and the willpower to exert itself onto this very new nation. Um, there are two things that obviously happened then, the war with Kashmir and also the hostile takeover of uh, Balochistan that happened in 1948. So two major operations that a military undertakes right at the birth of the nation. But I think, I think Ati is also very right by, that by 68 and specifically after 71, the military is in complete and utter shambles, both um, militarily in terms of a defeat and 90,000 prisoners and war and all that stuff, but also ideologically and also in, this, in the way that it, it, is, uh, it, it, it holds a position in the nation's self-imagination. So I think by 1971, Atiyah is absolutely right that some real possibilities did exist for um, a true left or a true democratic process to begin. Um, so what happened? And what happened, in my, again, non-expert opinion, was that Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, the f flag bearer of the left, whose manifesto of his party was um, socialist, was for the people, who promised that every peasant would receive, uh, what, 13 acres or 14 acres of land, um, who was going to introduce land reform and put a ceiling on how much land can be owned, who was going to reorganize um, Pakistan in, a, in, a, in, the, in the first time since, uh, since its birth. It was him who undertook a very explicit program to rehabilitate the military. And that program went on throughout the 70s, and it was him who actually literally killed off the left in Pakistan. I mean, there are no, you know, no sort of 
great debate about that. Um, his turn towards Islam as a founding and sort of left, and he purged the party of all left members and and sort of turned his attention squarely towards Islamization efforts. This is Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, the father of Benazir Bhutto. Um, his hand-picked general, Ziaul Haq, uh, when he um, overthrew Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto's government, he actually stepped in at a moment of another mass movement in Pakistan. So we mentioned the 68 uh, but I think there was there's a the a movement that happened in 1979 also bears attention here, um, where the uh, 77 sorry where Pakistanis went out onto the street against Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, hundreds and thousands of them, um, and that gave finally this rehabilitated military the opportunity to step back in, to claim itself as the center of Pakistan. So I think you're both right. I think I'm rightest of all. <laughs> uh, just a quick point. You talk about the movement in 1977, not 1979, but 1977, right? which led to uh, the second uh, martial law, uh, Zawal Haq's martial law. But then you have stories about what happened, exactly happened in 77. Uh, the military sources now confess, they admit that, I mean, one of the things which the military does is create political parties. Uh, it is wonderful. Uh, they create and breed uh, political parties and political leaders that like you would breed chicken. Uh, all right, one set of political leaders, one decade, all right, you get bored of them, the next one. Uh, so you, in, in order to replace the first set, then you bring in the second set and then the third set. We are probably going to the fourth set now. Uh, so 77, I mean, 77 in many ways was like what you had in Iran in the 1960s when General Mossad, uh, sorry, uh, President uh, Mossadegh's government was overthrown, uh, you know, heavily funded by uh, the CIA, uh, the whole public uh, outcry against Mossadegh. Uh, you know, it's later we find, I found, we find out that it's not necessarily the Iranian people. Uh, you know, poverty also has its own dynamics. So 77, I mean, 77, he was, Bhutto was, overthrown at a point when he had sat down with his, the opposition. They had an agreement that elections will be reheld. Uh, he had committed to all of that. The eve of the, when Bhutto and the opposition reached an agreement was the evening that Zaul Haq walked in to power. Uh, so, you know, one has to be mindful of, of uh, you know, of that. And I, I don't think that I'm, you know, I'm not saying that, in a way, I'm not separating the two, the military and the civil. What, in fact, I'm saying uh, is that military, there is a culture, there's a certain culture of elite authoritarianism in Pakistan. And military as an institution is as much a part of it as individual political leaders, uh, like Bhutto. I mean, Bhutto, on the one hand, talks about democracy, but then more than just killing the left, it goes and creates greater symbols of authority. I mean, don't forget that in the 1970s when he came into power, one of the first things he did was create an alternative military institution, his Federal Security Force, which was to be like Iranian Savak. Uh, you know, perhaps it would play that role. Uh, so, you know, it was creating institutions of authority. Now, what happens is, that because the military is there as an institution, I mean, unfortunately today, it still remains in 60 years the only institution which has survived with a learning curve. So it knows how to play with politicians, it knows how to play with people more than uh, the other way around. So in terms of an institution, it's the only beneficiary. Nobody else learns, although they're part of the whole game, because they are not backed by, uh, by an institution.
Do you want to go to the question and answer period? Yeah, okay. So um, I guess we'll prepare now um, for the question and answer period. And I know often people um, want to preface their questions with some explanation, but if you could just please, please keep it less than a minute. Um, and we have a gentleman with a microphone who will come up to you if you simply raise your hand. Um, and if you could just keep the question to less than a minute, be highly appreciated. The Pakistani military, by funding the Islamists, created their first monster that might finally devour the military because they, the military, by not spreading the benefits of modernization to the public at large, has created its first monster in, Islam, in Islamic radicalism that they, if they, they, they would probably overthrow the military if they had real power. And, then they're, and, they're, and they're pretty dangerous. Well, sir, uh, the monster was actually not created by the Pakistani military, it was created by the CIA. Uh, goes back to uh, the 1980s. 1980s when the United States was fighting its uh, famous war in Afghanistan with the Pakistani military and was trying, struggling to turn Afghanistan into USSR's Vietnam. That was the time when religious seminaries kind of blossomed and, and, and uh, you know, proliferated in Pakistan, and the monster of religious radicalism was created uh, because that was the only way you could make non-state actors take the burden of your war. Uh, I mean, this was one of the most cost-effective ways for the American taxpayers to fight a war against the communist superpower. And we in Pakistan are, you know, continue to suffer from it. But, you know, that's also correct that once you allow all other institutions to kind of stop growing, then radicalism grows. I mean, I take your point. But, you know, in response to your point that the Pakistani military created it, the answer is no. Yes, I was just curious about... Um the demonstrations we saw in the media um, over the opposition in the Supreme Court to Musharraf, and we, you showed some images of the lawyers, I guess, being beat up by um, police. And I was also curious, um, I had heard about some larger, seemingly more mass demonstrations in some of the urban areas where shops were being closed down and people were taken to the streets, but it wasn't clear from the coverage I saw what elements of society were taking part in those demonstrations, whether it was more of a middle class, petty bourgeois movement, or whether there were um, workers groups involved, or what sort of organization was behind uh, those demonstrations. Um, so what, what gentleman is referring to is that since um, March of 2007, when the Musharraf's military regime um, sacked and tried to try the Chief Justice of Pakistan, there was a movement, uh, and it's being debated highly among people not participating in said movement, whether it is or not one, um, by lawyers primarily to agitate and organize for the reinstatement of the Chief Justice and um, to sort of uh, balance out the judicial uh, moves that have been made against Musharraf. The immediate backstory to that that's relevant to, our, to the discussion about whether or not it is a movement or not or what constitutes it is that the Chief Justice uh, and the Supreme Court in Pakistan itself had suddenly become interested in um, vanishings, in people um, going missing after getting into touch with the Pakistan's military um, in some f form or another. And this backstory, wherein the Chief Justice was going to perhaps investigate, perhaps find something that Musharraf was not keen on uh, having the Western eyes on, um, gave 
gave sense, gave rise to this strike against uh, the judiciary. The judiciary and the military have had a nice, warm, cordial relationship throughout the history of Pakistan. More or less, they have balanced each other and supported each other. Um, but this was the first real um, st sort of strikeout between the two of them. Um, the movement started as a lawyer's movement. It started as a judicial movement in March and, um, of 2007. But it has progressed into the other um, areas which are usually um, the harbingers of, of sort of mass uh, activities. So students, uh, professional classes, and middle class in, in general. Um, it hasn't since um, October, but specifically since the murder, uh, the assassination of Benazir Bhutto, um, it has come across, come down, the, government, the city of Pakistan has come down with really draconian measures against uh, organizing, against uh, dissemination of material that is critical of Pakistan, um, and other sort of overt and covert uh, activities to try and stop this from happening. Um, but that Having said that, the lawyer's movement was a first real, and at least in my estimation, social movement that has broken out in the last 10 years. But I don't know, my panelists would maybe disagree with it. But there is definitely a disagreement in the, in the wider reading of what has happened in 2007 as to how broad this movement is and how significant it is. I don't know. Yeah, I think that um uh, one should be careful in understanding uh, lawyers' demonstrations as any kind of sustained political social movement because, um, first of all, there isn't any kind of consistency of policy or any alternative program to institute. And also it is the same judiciary and the same lawyers who also allowed Benazir Bhutto, despite all the corruption charges that she had, to re-enter the country. So why weren't they protesting then against her corruption and against uh, the uh, sort of against her government in the 90s so i think it would be one should be careful in sort of putting so much at stake or in this movement i i think it is a it is a reaction and it is it is some kind of a discontent that has been expressed by uh, Pakistani lawyers, middle class lawyers, but it is not in any way equivalent to a, a social movement that can carry on the struggle. But very, but very quickly, I think its significance lies in, in two things. You know, even if you call it a reaction, uh, here you have uh, lawyers, you know, who are not even big lawyers, these are middle class professionals, uh, who depend on their profession, who depend on their working, everyday work, for their bread and butter. Uh, and they understand, I mean, once, see, the, the, the movement uh, for restoration uh, of rule of law and the Chief Justice in Pakistan dates back to when, uh, to, to March of, of, of last year. That's when the Chief Justice was uh, dismissed and arbitrarily dismissed by Musharraf. Now, what the government had calculated was that, all right, comes May, June, the, the movement had started in March. So they said, all right, these people will, uh, will get tired. Comes May, June, it'll be so f hot that you know, they wouldn't even dare come out on the streets comes May, June, July, August, people are still out on the streets. Uh, then, you know, finally it was restored. Uh, the CJ was restored. And then the question was, to many of the, uh, you know, the, the leadership of the lawyers' movement, all right, what do we do now? In many ways, many of the analysts uh, thought that uh, the restoration of CJ has been counterproductive to the movement. Uh, because it was so much around uh, the restoration of the CJ. But then, you know, we have such a fantastic president. He keeps making all sorts of mistakes. Uh, you know, he, there was this emergency, dismissed the Chief Justice again. Uh, and again, you know, the lawyers are out in the street. Yes, at one level, it is uh, 
it's a reaction. It does not have the masses on board and there are a number of explanations for that. But why the rule of law is suddenly important, I think it's, it's very significant. It saves the society even symbolically from a lot of crises. I mean, I remember had, having this discussion in Pakistan with the, uh, we had the British High Commissioner, you know, comment that, you know, this is not a mass movement, so, you know, it's not important. And some of us were arguing that, look, symbolically, it's important to restore the rule of law, you know, if nothing else. Because the common man who had this confidence, this sense that he could go and knock at the door, in the, in, the, in the missing person's case, people could go, imagine, knock at a door and say, my loved one is lost. Somebody has come and picked him up. He has disappeared in the middle of the night. I can't find him. I have no power to go and persuade any of the government functionaries to tell me where my loved ones is. And here was an institution which was making it possible, at least, to make the government accountable. The, the Chief Justice had become unpopular because he would drag these very senior bureaucrats, police officials, to court and say, you know, excuse me, uh, produce these people. If you have to arrest them, arrest them under proper warrants. Today, this man, this common man, has no hope of going and knocking at any door. Does this not create more suicide bombers. Uh, that is a question, you know, that is an issue from, you know, it, it's this perspective which makes the movement uh, important. But I think um, as far as Pakistani judiciary goes, it has, I think it's, it has always been a mix of a, a Sharia law and civil law. And because of a certain kind of supremacy or certain kind of instrumental use of the Sharia law, I think Pakistani common man has always suffered. And especially, I think, uh, with the institution of blasphemy law and the Hudud ordinance that was anti-women because anybody could be called uh, committing an adultery, uh, they actually went against Pakistani civil society in a very major way in the 70s, and uh, sorry, in the 80s. And I think um, Pakistani common man or Pakistani society never received any adequate protection from this institution. And so today, if all of these lawyers are rising up against uh, Musharraf, I think, yes, it expresses a kind of a social frustration and social discontent, and which is, I mean, it is all right. It's, it's okay, it's good, but then what is the potential? What, where is this movement going to go? And I think it is this p potential that one should question, and I, I think it's not clear what one can Oh, but Atiyah, if I could for a minute disagree with you, uh -huh. that it's more than just, uh, you know, a random movement. I mean, how else do you build alternative institutions? I mean, I quite agree that, uh, well, firstly, I disagree with your point that, you know, it's a mix of British common law and Sharia law. In 1980s, there were specific laws, uh, you know, which had Sharia in them. There were specific laws which had, which used, uh, you know, British common law. In fact, what we've had in our legal system is British common law. Ziaul Haq brought the Sharia in. Sharia sits on the margins of the legal system. For example, in 1980s, if they were to, you know, if the police would pick you up and wanted to book you, they would ask you, so what should I book you under? Uh, you know, the, the, the British, the, the common law, or do you want to be booked under the Islamic law? And of course, the Islamic law meant that, uh, you know, the sentence would be much harsher. So, you know, people would beg, uh, you know, bribe or whatever, right? So Sharia, in a way, has been put there on the margins by the regime of General Ziaul Haq. The judiciary, of course, being part of the elite, never had the nerve to challenge. I mean, doing my book, I went through cases after cases, court cases, right, in which judges were not forthcoming 
in questioning wherever you had military's interest. But here is something which is in a way different. 13 judges of the Supreme Court and the High, High Court in different, in, 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 from the four uh, High Courts of, of the country resigned. They refused to take oath under the PCO, which is a provincial constitutional order, right? This is significant. This is a movement uh, away from, you know, towards building another alternative, perhaps a stronger judiciary. I'm not saying this is perfect, but I would say, you know, perhaps imagine this movement as something more than just a temporary reaction. It would have a long-term impact. Um, the term Islamic fundamentalism and, uh, uh, sorry, Islamic terrorism and not Islamic fundamentalism has often been used in conjunction with Pakistan. And I personally just don't understand that term. Could I have uh, your comments on that? What was the term again? I'm sorry. Islamic terrorism. I don't mean Islamic fundamentalism here, but Islamic terrorism. This is used by who? This has been used in a lot of American press. So, you, so you're saying what does Americans mean when they use the yeah, term? Yeah, I, I want to understand that because I understand the term Islamic fundamentalism, but Islamic terrorism, that just, I, I really can't understand it. Thing is whether the difference is if you say a Hail Mary or a Kalma before you blow yourself up. <laughs> if you just keep raising your hands, he's coming around. Would would any of you like to comment upon on the relationship between the feudal and the military? Uh, elite in Pakistan. I noticed, of course, uh, it's well known that uh, the military in Pakistan, unlike most other militaries, actually is a land holding, um, is a landlord. I mean, they, they, they own all this land and are, have all these serfs working for them. Uh, one of the notions that people have, or some people have, about the difference between, say, the Indian military and the Pakistani military, and the reason that the Indian military has not had such power or such predominance in the country as the Pakistani military has, is that in India there were land reforms which really broke the back of the, of the feudal system, and in Pakistan there weren't. Would anyone like to comment whether the lack of land reforms is what has led, or one, one possible reason that has, led, that has led to the predominance and the great power that the Pakistani military enjoys? Well, I mean, I'll let... Aisha or Atiya answer, but I think there have been three land reform attempts in Pakistan. Uh, early 50s, um, 72 under Bhutto, and then uh, also in 77. In all of them, they tried to put a ceiling on how much land one can own, uh, individuals, but they also uh, tried to redistribute land that was not Punjabi or Sindhi land. But you can... So firstly, I think feudalism or the lack of land reforms is, in, is independent of the growth of the military institution. In fact, the military institution is a beneficiary of it. Manan was here talking about uh, land reforms. Uh, see, one of the problems of land reforms is that uh, the land collected by the state from different big landowners was never completely redistributed. Uh, I think about 40%, uh, which, has been, which was uh, collected in the 1960s, then uh, twice in the 1970s, is not being distributed. And you have 20 million landless peasants, uh, which are you know, still waiting. Primarily the reason is because uh, the governments, be it military or, or, or civil, they look at land or as, as an asset which could be used to manipulate and, and buy votes. Uh, so right before elections, you will have prime ministers uh, going around distributing uh, you know, some land as a symbolic gesture. Uh, that, all right, you, know, you poor people, you can have some. But then the, the, 
the problematic thing is that the manner in which it's distributed, it does not benefit uh, the recipient. For example, if I am in the middle of uh, the desert or if I'm in the middle of anywhere, right, and I'm given 12 and a half acres of land or even 50 acres of land, if I do not have uh, access to mar farm to market road or water, which are two basic facilities which the state controls completely, you know, those 50 acres are worth nothing. And this is exactly what happens uh, with the subaltern within, within the military as well. The soldiers get 12 and a half acres on a, you know, on the system of point bases, whatever the military has. But those 12 and a half acres come to nothing. Reason being that, again, if you're not a general, if you're not a senior officer, you do not get access to, uh, uh, you know, to the f farm to market road. Those pictures I had on my slides, these were pictures of General Musharraf's land. Uh, you know, lovely agriculture, and it's not maybe that he has a greater sense of agriculture or farming than, you know, the other, than the other people. It's just that he's got power to have those facilities. See, feudalism as a symbol, as an institution, as an, an, uh, a powerful elite group, it was sustained. But this was not the only group which was there. You had, firstly, you had the state was critical. State's role was critical in building up the big industrialists and the big entrepreneurs in the country as well. And in the process, while this development was taking place, this is the 1960s. The military itself, in the name of playing a role uh, for, for na of national development, became a major stakeholder in all these other elite groups. 1950s, just briefly, 1950s was when most of the military came from elite families, the officer guard. 1960s, they started to begin to change it because there weren't too many families anyway. But what they then did was institutionalize the, the mechanism that you would get people from the lower middle class into the military, but once you are there and once you get promoted to become part of the military elite, then you have a vertical and horizontal integration with the rest of the ruling elite. So yes, feudalism is a problem continues to be lack of land reforms. But it's also a symbolic, in many ways, a symbolic problem uh, because it reflected the manner in which the state of Pakistan and the leadership, especially the founding leadership of Pakistan, would redistribute resources. Um, I think maybe I look at the problem slightly differently. And uh, first of all, I'd like to say that Feudalism is also a rather anachronistic term. That after the creation of Pakistan, I think Pakistan is quite closely tied to global capital system. And what happens is that it actually begins to uh, imbibe or what begins to be constituted in Pakistan is a retrograde form of capital, which is based on the contradictions of uneven development. And this development that was uh, uh, sort of introduced in Pakistan especially became much more prominent during Ayub Khan's period when uh, Pakistan followed a state-centric developmental model. And uh, one of the results of this unevenness or the contradictions was that how, yes, I think it's correct to say, as uh, Professor Siddiqa points out, that army began to uh, amass land and actually began to take control over land, but as, I think, a, a capitalist force. So it is the, it is the uh, regressive form of capitalist relations that kind of are consolidated in Pakistan since the 50s and 60s and in 70s and 80s, 80s especially, it takes up the fo different form where uh, the military actually sort of has seeped into the different layers of Pakistani society as a dominant capitalist class. 
Althea, I wouldn't call the military as a capitalist institution in Pakistan. It's very feudal. Sorry, can I just interject and ask, because may, forgive my ignorance, but what, what is meant by the category of, of, of feudal in the South Asian landscape, I mean contemporary South Asian landscape? I, I will go with I, Dr. Sadiqa, since you, you both last night and today invoked it as a category of analysis, what you mean by the fact that it remains feudal. See, I wouldn't go by the, uh, just by the, the definition of uh, you know feudalism as the division between uh, capital and labor, I would look at it in terms of the relationship between uh, the lord of the manor, uh, the vessel, and and uh, you know the the land now or the fiefs which the lord of the manor would distribute in in return for for the military service uh, has now been replaced. Uh, you, you know, in, 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 in many uh, ways and forms. So the institution is, is very, that way is very authoritarian. Uh, it uses, it monopolizes resources to benefit, uh, it, you know, it, the, the, the manner in which it uses, it exercises its authority uh, to build that power. Uh, and the manner in which it redistributes resources. I mean, this entire economy that I talk about is not necessarily to give more money to its officers to spend. It's to give them more power. So sim it's symbolically, uh, you know, it remains feudal. Well, I think feudal, feudal is just um, it's a misnomer um, because when the military is, I mean, at the helm of sort of organizing social relations and capitalism, I mean, first of all, Pakistan largely is a service economy. It depends on remissions that come from the Gulf state, comes from Australia or England. And so when, I mean, I, I think the, uh, the investigation that you have followed through in your book and the constitution of Milbus, which is that military is now an industrial corporation or it's an industrial complex, shows that it is a form of a capitalist class that is now at the helm of the state. And it's, I think it would be inadequate to call or think of it as a feudal class. I mean, what I don't understand what we mean by that because Pakistan, Pakistan has, I think, a very backward form of uh, land relations or agricultural relations. But I think those relations are fundamentally capitalist. I think if I can interject again, um, the Mughals. Um, in the early, early modern period in India had a, um, a unique system of governance which uh, relied on both court-appointed um, nobles, land, landed elite, and standing armies in various parts of India. The, and, you know, this tripartite system. One of those uh, were the Jagirdars. And the Jagirdars were people whose land the army could stand on and act at the behest of the king whenever they wanted action in, in some place. And I think that the military may not be feudal in that sense, but they're definitely Jagirdars. Um, they are, uh, in that sense, I think, um, you know, hearkening back to the, to the Mughal era. So maybe instead of looking at Europe and doing some feudal analysis. We can just look to the Mughals and do some Jagiri analysis. Yeah, their, their activities have changed. I mean, it's not just, I, mean, I don't call them feudal just because they own land. It's how they generally conduct themselves vis-a-vis -vis other institutions. I mean, look, once you join the military, there is this unwritten social contract between uh, you know, the, the, the top management and whoever ever is in the organization. If you abide by certain rules and principles, if you abide by certain norms, you get benefits. If you don't, 
then you can forget about it. And I'll give you a, a, an example, comparative example. I mean, today, General Musharraf has got uh, eight, nine plots of land. He is a, a millionaire in, in dollar terms. Compare that with the three brigadiers who in 1977, that is when Bhutto was ousted, refused to shoot at the public procession. The people out on the streets and these guys were called in order to shoot and there were three brigadiers who refused. Of course, Ziaul Haq benefited, came in, overthrew Bhutto, but the, the story that we don't know about is what happened to these three brigadiers. They were completely stripped off all benefits. Uh, you know, the wonderful housing schemes, the, the servants, the, uh, you know, many other things that we, these officers get, they were deprived of that. Uh, the same goes for, you know, general, uh, uh, but, uh, this is this is the chap who was to become the army chief, to, made army chief by by Nawaz Sharif, stripped of all uh, all benefits. It is that social contract. It is that lord of the manor vessel relationship, which makes the behavior. I mean, they can go into capital, they can go into industry, but the way they manage it. Uh, is much more authoritarian in a very feudal sense. Um, I think there's another way we can look at this problem, which is that what, uh, how this debate has been inherited in the context of Pakistan through uh, actually the Chinese Revolution and also a Stalinization of uh, political thought and political movements, where uh, peasants were celebrated as revolutionary subjects, especially in the 1970s. And I think that's one reason why feudalism and the category peasant became endowed with a certain kind of political agency and political power. And what it did was that it actually uh, produced very inadequate studies and inadequate results of understanding what was really um, the existing social relations were about. And I think in some sense, they produced a form of misrecognition and uh, which was generated by the existing capitalist social relations in the Indian subcontinent or in India and in Pakistan. So I think we also need to think that how um, sort of, especially from the vantage of the left and leftist histories, this uh, category peasant and feudal actually began to impinge on any kind of progressive uh, solutions and programs in South Asia. Uh, thank you. Athiya, I'm pretty impressed by your presentation and the, uh, the history you mentioned, uh, how you have uh, uh, expertise in the details of how, what incidents took place in Pakistan since 1947. The, I, I, I'm brought up and grown up in Pakistan. I studied there before coming here, definitely. The thing which I really cannot conceive is the point of view you're presenting is like Pakistan has these, uh, 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 the leftist organizations were very strong initially in Pakistan and then they kind of disappeared and uh, failed after the, after the Bhutto, uh, after Bhutto took power. The, in this whole picture, the the thing which bothers me is nobody has mentioned here that what is the basis of even creation of Pakistan, how Pakistan came into being. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Pakistan is one of the two ideological countries in the world. One is Israel and next is Pakistan because Pakistan was created because Muslims of India felt that they needed land where they can practice their religion and their culture. What happened after 47 is exactly how you describe. Mm -hmm. But the failure of left is not only due to 
the uh, few people like Bhutto who actually betrayed the left, but also due to the very uh, sense and very uh, character of the nation, which lives, 75% of which lives in the rural areas, and who actually had very strong faith in religion, and is being led by the local, uh, we, we call in the common language mullahs, or the, the, the imams of the masjids and mosques, and uh, uh, their, their whole life revolves around religion. And I think the failure of uh, the, uh, the, the, the Marxist or socialist uh, 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 movements in Pakistan was mainly because of that factor alone, that it did not allow people to accept these individuals as part of their life. For example, when I, I was growing up, I was a student, and uh, let me uh, really uh, uh, confess that uh, talking about Faz was like a taboo. Faz Ahmed Faz, oh, he is a communist, he's a Russian agent, and you can't talk about him, you can't even, you know, read his poetry in public. Because that was the, that was the, the whole, whole uh, 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 spirit of the, the environment. I mean, you cannot get out of it. If, uh, so the, the, the reasons you were giving are very valid, but there's this big chunk which is missing uh, from your uh, presentation that uh, I don't know if you have uh, uh, deliberately ignored it or you, 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 you don't have uh, uh, an insight into it and how... I don't know what's your region, where are you from, but that's what I felt, that uh, the boy, uh, we saw a picture of a boy which a doctor um, had put there uh, who had his, her pants, his pants down. And that picture and that incident, incident kept me awake for three days, and I cried. Because this is the height where we see that there is, a, there is, there is this class difference between common person and the bureaucrats and the agencies. I mean, in this environment, why is left is not succeeding in Pakistan in, in, in preventing these incidents to happen and to stand for the poor and, and the people who are actually deprived of everything? I mean, that's what we have to understand and that's what we have to study. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, um yeah, that's, that's quite interesting. But I think that um, religion actually didn't play any role in the constitution of Pakistan. The Jamaat-e Islami uh, or Jamaat-e Ulumai Hind in 1947 was quite ambivalent on the question of Pakistan. And it was only afterwards, after the creation of Pakistan, that they began to accept its uh, constitution and its existence. So religion, I think, was quite at bay in the early years of Pakistan. And as far as sort of the development in the 50s and the 60s go, uh, what I have heard from my father and his friends that everybody was a socialist. And everybody actually was reading socialist literature, Marxist literature in the cities of Karachi, Lahore, Hyderabad. There was a very distinct and distinguished kind of a cafe culture where people used to collect, gather together, and talk about politics, discuss politics. So even there, I don't think that religion was such an important social factor that was influencing social consciousness. It was only, I think, later, and especially um, by the late 70s and early 80s, that religion assumes a very different kind of a significance. And, and that's another shift. It's a social shift that Pakistan goes through. And uh, we have to understand the importance of religion, which I think gets tied to the development of Islamicism and Islamic forces. Um, in Pakistan and in Afghanistan. And since then, I think religion becomes, I mean, what Pakistani middle class really is proud of is the fact that it is not, it was never Pakistan, but India, that an Indian society that voted for Hindutva. And Jamaat Islami was never at the fore in Pakistani politics. But now I think things have changed. And now Islamicism poses a very real and a different kind of a danger, which was not the case in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, my question is about the possible role of, of international uh, 
solidarity or, or interventions or, or just uh, the way that uh, for a, a solution to Pakistan's failure might arise out of uh, uh, some sort of movement at the international level, uh, a sort of new international left. Uh, the question of whether or not the, the military apparatus in Pakistan is, is futile or, or capitalist uh, seems to, uh, at one level, just be a, a matter of capturing the, uh, the specificity of, of, of the institution itself. But another level, it also raises the question of uh, whether there is a solution to be found within Pakistan or whether the solution uh, is to be found more within uh, the contemporary world order. Yeah, I think Pakistan or the solution of Pakistan is very closely tied to the international events and what is uh, happening internationally. And in that sense, and I think that's what Platypus stands for, is some kind of a reconstitution of the international left. Because Pakistan, um, internal revolution in Pakistan is required and is necessary, but I think it has to be sustained by some kind of an international overcoming of the existing social relations, existing capitalist relations. So in that sense, uh, one needs to rejuvenate and reconstitute or reconsider what does it mean to have an international left today? I mean, well, yes, uh, you know, um, I think in, 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 from a certain perspective, this is a very conservative recipe. Uh, I've done that myself. I, I kind of did that in my book. I thought, well, you know, uh, let's be realist. How would a change come in Pakistan? And my solution was all right. While there is an internal movement, you know, one should work towards that. There should also should be the push from inside, from outside big powers, United States, etc., putting pressure the way they kind of brought some changes in Latin America. Now, that itself is a very contradictory statement. Uh, why wait for things to change uh, outside? Perhaps the things might never change outside. Uh, it's a whole, uh, you know, huge struggle there out there, which may or may not take place. Uh, why depend on that? And, you know, it's, 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 it's a conservative recipe also from the standpoint that, you know, currently the, the kind of system that you have globally, why would it benefit and how would it benefit for, for bringing a pro-people change in Pakistan or any other, uh, any other country? But having said that, I think... Yeah, I mean, the global and the regional and the national are connected. But to keep searching for the regional and the global to change before you make your own changes is almost like, you know, ignoring uh, or neglecting or, uh, you know, uh, deliberately running away from your own responsibility. Well, I think... Um I think we may benefit by thinking of this problem not in terms of um, outside or inside, that Pakistan is outside of this other international global complex, but rather that um, this is one complex and that the solution has to be imminent. So. It has to be from within Pakistan as well as from within the rest of the world. And that's where I think the importance of the reconsideration of the question of the left is, important, is very significant. Because what has been left out of political, social, or any theoretical discourse today is the question of politics and the way politics shapes and reshapes these capitalist relations. So we also need to actually deepen our understanding of what do we mean by global capital today and the way it is uh, undermining transformation and the way it is also generating possibilities of transformation because these two things go hand in hand. So there is a dynamic 
that we need to explore and actually have a very good grasp of in order to then think of alternatives in the world. Because the, real, the question is that it's not only Pakistan which is at stake, but it is actually the world. It's not that, I don't think the situation in the United States is really pretty today. I mean, there are problems, there are lots of problems, but they may not be as grave as they are in Africa or in Pakistan or in other developing countries. But that they're all kind of tied together. And so the solution to these problems also need to be thought of uh, in, in, in international terms, which is sorely lacking at this point. We're going to take two more questions and then we'll wrap things up. Um, I wanted to interrogate the, uh, you used a formulation, uh, Islamic fascism, and you also mentioned Hindutva, and there were a lot of people on the left and liberals who called the BJP fascist at one point, but they obviously got voted out of power, which you couldn't imagine happening to Hitler or Mussolini. So I wanted to, do you, like what kind of saliency or substance do you find to this label with respect to the Islamic fundamentalists? Well, I, I just mean, um, I mean, these terms are now used quite interchangeably, uh, Islamic fascism or Islamic fundamentalism, which is not, uh, it's not akin to what Nazi socialism uh, stood for, but what I mean is that these are conservative reactionary forces that actually threaten any kind of issues of social transformation. Um, I had a question about, you've basically talked about military rule and uh, left. So is there no other way in Pakistan to have a secular democracy uh, regime that's center or conservative or whatever? Is it only left or military? I mean, what's the reason for this focus? Um, the way I understand this is in terms of sort of successive failures of any progressive politics in Pakistan which allowed the military to assume this um, powerful role in, in the country. And it, is now, it has now become an uncontested or a power because um, there isn't any uh, cohesive uh, social political movement that can challenge this institution. And so it, that's why, I mean, if we go back in history, what I was trying to say is that we can understand the constitution of Pakistani military as an uncontested power in the absence of a real left, in the absence of a vital left. So, in, and because of that, or because of this absence, there aren't any real alternatives that can challenge this institution. Sorry, we actually have time for one last question. Could I, could I just quickly add oh, sorry, yeah, something? Uh, you see, sorry to give you this impression that it's either the military or the left. Uh, see, like, you know, United States is uh, a secular state where you have the wonderful Bible Belt as well. Uh, you know, you have the fundamentalists, the Christian fundamentalists as well as any other fundamentalists. Now, in Pakistan, uh, you've had, you've had, when we say secular, what do you mean? It means non-government of non-religious parties. Uh, and we've had governments of non-religious parties. Now, the problem, very briefly, of where this extremism has come in, because as Atiyah says, and I totally agree, because there is no other movement, and because politicians and military leaders, the entire leadership, has systematically used Islam to buy legitimacy. You see, on the one hand, you were 
you know, you you created a state. You were supposed to be feeding people, sh- giving them shelter, giving them opportunities to clothe themselves, which you were not willing to do, right? So what do you do? You feed them with the religious rhetoric, and that has continued to happen. I mean, contrary f- to what a lot of us like to say that extremism began with General Ziaul Haq in Pakistan. It actually goes back in many ways to Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. Uh, he was the one person who brought in, you know, very rules with rules and regulations, very Islamic flavor. And since then, I mean, pick up any leader. Eventually, they go to that religious discourse because of the lack of legitimacy. One hopes that, and that's, that's why the importance of, of religion has increased, because people do not see, everybody seems to have failed. You know, maybe you have the rule of God, uh, you know, which would bring us greater benefits. Our, our question people who demand Sharia in Pakistan, Sharia is very complex. You start asking them, they'll be like, well, you know, uh, we want Sharia because we'll get justice, we get equitable distribution of resources. And one is sitting, standing there saying, well, you know, this is something which would get with good governance. But yes, at the moment, religion seems to be replacing uh, what a role which could have been filled by any 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 uh, other party, which could have been filled by improving governance. I I was trying to think of how the narrative of the evening kind of built up, and I think it was on this question of the non necessity of a failure. Um, I think that when the doctor started speaking, um, you made it very clear that you thought about history as a kind of building blocks so that already in 1947 you saw a kind of um, a beginning of something that was then just a development that sort of continued and progressively got worse or progressively increased in strength. I think that the perhaps the main difference between your opinion and Atiyah's is that there is this moment in where that kind of development could have been challenged and so what we have to I think say is, is, that, is that true um, I think that the first panelist agrees that that could have been challenged, there could have been a definite change. So if we agree with that, then it seems to be that the present could have been configured in an entirely different manner. Um, if we agree that, there could have been a possibility of changing it. So then the question of the left really becomes pertinent for the present, not simply because, you know, not simply because the, the, the left needs to activate the present, but rather because the left fail in reconsidering how its role could have actually stopped this opportunist right from developing into what now appears to be a kind of self-evident affirmation of power. Um, I find that more helpful, but also wonder uh, what the necessity is of, of your talk to kind of emphasize a kind of progression of, of the right or an empowerment of the right versus a kind of opportunity of the left. That was your uh, question for you, Doctor. Oh, sorry. You see, firstly, uh, I'm a bit of a skeptic when I looked at the 70s. Yeah, on the face of it, it looks like an opportunity when things could have changed. Uh, you know, the military is is kind of withdrawn in terms of its power. It has 90,000 90, prisoners of war. It's completely demoralized. All of that. Fantastic. Uh, can we build on it? Now, my problem with this is that maybe it was not the change that we think all the time that it is. Uh, there was something else happening as well. Uh, 1971, we have the first popular elections, uh, representative elections in Pakistan, which throws up two parties. One is the Awami League in East, the Eastern Wing, and the other is the P- Pakistan People's Party, which is Bhutto's party in the Western Wing. Right Now, technically, because it's one-man vote, uh, according to the one-man, one-vote principle, 
Sheikh Mujibur Rahman heading the Awami League could should have become the Prime Minister because, uh, you know, he held the majority, right? And he had some coalition, uh, some partners in, in the Western Wing as well. He could have formed the government. He was, on the other hand, put uh, there was a case instituted against him. It was called the Ag- Agartala conspiracy case in which the government in- in- accused him of a conspiracy, uh, you know, against the military, against the government of Pakistan. Later, they withdrew all those uh, allegations. On the other hand, Bhutto was sent around the world selling the Kashmir project. So, initially, the military... The, the, the generals were wanted to have the jamaat e islami uh, the religious party, uh, to be there. Now, once that didn't happen, because, you know, the people out in the streets voted for two, you know, very obviously, you know, very secular parties there. Once that happened, they went for a man who was closer uh, in thinking to their, uh, to their nationalist ideology and agenda than, than the other. So the move was towards Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, who would then not destroy, uh, disassemble uh, the institution, dim, uh, disempower it, but actually eventually build it. And this is exactly what happened. So when I look at Pakistan's history and look at the events, I mean, firstly, I'm a little uh, skeptical of whether 70s was that, uh, you know, 70s did offer that shift or not. So, you know. Uh. I think, um, yeah, I think I, I, it's correct. And that's where one needs to be more analytical towards what the left stood for in the 70s. And also the kinds of problems it had inherited from the old left, which is, now, which is completely forgotten. It is the left of the 30s and the 40s and the kinds of problems that were then passed on to the left in the 60s were not critically analyzed or were not digested properly, and hence the left also faltered in its own struggles. And I think that's 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 an open project today, and I think that's what we need to also uh, analyze. And then we can we can yeah we can see how maybe the, the 60s had become a foreclosed possibility for transformation. But the question really is that how did it happen? And then that actually that means that we have to carry out a very systematic examination of this history which was wedded to the idea of transformation. Now, very quickly on, on the left in Pakistan then, uh, it's almost like a regional divide. I mean, earlier on they were talking about, you know, the, the Soviet influence. Sindh and Balochistan, south and southwest, uh, were more inclined towards, uh, uh, you know, the Soviet Union. But in Punjab itself, uh, the, the left you had was more pro-China. And one of the reasons that left failed was because 1960s, with growing tension between India and Pakistan, a war in 1965 and later in 71, uh, in which China came and embraced Pakistan. Uh, the left, which was pro-China, didn't know where to uh, you know, park themselves because the Chinese establishment was so close to the Pakistani establishment, they were thought, they were, therefore they, didn't, they, they lost the argument. Uh, so in, in, instead, I mean, that further diluted uh, the influence of, or, or even the power of their argument. Okay, if any of you um, didn't get an opportunity to ask questions, our three presenters will be here for a short while longer, so feel free to come up and talk afterwards. But that's going to conclude the program, and I just want to ask all of you to thank me in thanking, the, or to join, join me, not thank me, in <laughs> thanking the speakers thank so for, for giving up a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> thank you. Do you have books that are in the house? Do you have books that are in the house?
Huh? I didn't. I don't okay, have I didn't any. know if you had any copies of your book on you or not. No. no okay. I didn't. All right. No problem. Uh, because those books were they were kept by the seminary form yesterday. They did. No. Yeah, oh. they did. Yesterday. Yesterday. Yes. Oh. How are you doing? What? Silvers. <laughs> 